So the question is, when, if ever, should democracy apply? Um, Paul? <clears throat> so the standard answer to that question is the provision of what economists call public goods. And roughly, public goods are goods that cannot be supplied to one person with also supplying them to another. So it's the, the people who make the goods are not able to prevent the people who didn't make them from getting them without, roughly speaking, paying for them. Now, one important problem, sorry, that should say one problem, not one. One problem is that there aren't actually any public goods in the strict sense in question. There are no goods such that it is impossible to supply A without also supplying B, with one very important exception, which I forgot to say. The number one public good that genuinely is a public good is interpersonal peace. The only way I can get peace from you is from you. It is impossible for me to get your peace by myself. I can't do it. We need you uh, in on that act. In order for the, the, the public to be at peace uh, with each other, uh, they all have to be uh, both suppliers and consumers of that good. Uh, <clears throat> but apart from that, the things that most people mention are not actually public in the strictest sense of the term. Still, there are goods that are very difficult to supply to one person without also supplying to another. Uh, now, among the many things that are not public goods, to continue the list, are um, most of the things that modern governments do, such as uh, uh, health, education, and welfare. None of those things are public goods in the usual sense of the word. It's perfectly possible for one person to be healthy and another person to be sick. There are public uh, health issues, but they are comparatively few. Most health issues are not public in that sense. Uh, similarly, education, there's no problem about Jones knowing something that Smith not, doesn't know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, of course, there are lots and lots of goods where we can gain from organizations, but there's no reason why the organization shouldn't be voluntary. That's putting it way too weakly. There's all kinds of reasons why it should be voluntary. Voluntary organizations are, fa are fabulous at providing uh, all sorts of goods that require cooperation. Insurance groups, for example. But government imposing on an, or on an organization for this purpose is simply, I think, off base from the point of view of individual liberty. Next slide. Uh, so what do we do? Well, what democracy does is give everybody a vote and have them elect somebody who will handle all this stuff. Is that a good idea? Well, without restrictions? Not obviously. Next, Paul. After all, here's how a democracy works. I mean, a democracy of the usual type. Elected legislators um, uh, do all the governmental work. And of course, uh, setting it up that way gives them an interest in getting elected and getting reelected. And people, the people who vote for them, why do they vote? Now remember, what they're voting to do is to impose rules on everybody. That's to say a vote is a, vote, is a unit of political power. And power is power over all those other people. You get enough votes, and you're in a position to compel everybody to do what this uh, bunch of people want them to do. <clears throat> people vote on the basis of one or both of two things. Either self-interest, they try to vote to promote their own interests, or to realize a political vision of some kind. Uh, the most typical one is religious. Of course, uh, we think that there's a should be separation of church and state. We think this, and we would like it to be the case, but the fact is that lots and lots of people vote in order to help to have enlist the public to uh, 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 impose on people rules of the kind that their religion favors. It happens all the time. Now, the point is, whichever they do, democracy puts you and me under the thumb of either other people's interests and why should we be doing what they want us to do? Or other people's political philosophy, which almost amounts to the same thing, because it's their view about what everybody ought to do. Next slide. <clears throat> now, consider trying to promote your own interests by the way. Well, you need knowledge for that. But uh, let's bear in mind that in democracy, everybody has the vote. And everybody has the vote means that it, there is no such thing as a qualification for being a voter, apart from being like over 16 or whatever the voting age is set at. 
but all adults have a vote as a matter of constitutional right. I mean, people who uh, defend democracy do so on the ground of its universality. And this, by definition, means you cannot exclude people on the basis of knowledge. John Stuart Mill's attempt to uh, have plural voting. He was in favor of plural voting for the elite, for the people who knew more or who had done more and so forth. Well, that is, of course, a step away from democracy, not toward it. And so we cannot rely on people knowing anything, but to promote your interest, you do need to know something. In fact, you need to know quite a lot. Do people know a lot about the relevant things? Of course not. Consider all the people who talk about saving trees as if that were something terribly important for people to do. What an idiotic thing to do when you think right about it. <coughs> saving trees as if trees had rights. Uh, <coughs> or, <coughs> as I was putting this, I got a, a, um, a letter, I got a, a letter from, uh, of course, the mayor of Waterloo about something, and had a little footnote saying, please consider the environment before printing this email. Um, what if it's a complete idiocy? <laughs> or switching to expensive electric cars in order to help stop global warming. Or et cetera, et cetera. Think of all the things that you would need to know in order to govern people intelligently. Who knows them? Well, very few people. In fact, as Russ Harton once pointed out, he's a professor of uh, political science at, at um, New York University and uh, quite famous, and he's one of the eminent professors of political science. And as he pointed out to us in a class or in a seminar one time, um, uh, if you think that, that uh, uh, people are qualified uh, to vote on the basis of knowledge, he said, well, I just want to point out that I've been a professor of political science for 50 years, and I don't think I'm qualified to vote. <clears throat> Nobody is qualified to govern on the basis of the knowledge that you need in order to promote your interests by voting. <clears throat> and of course, if we ask, where, where do people learn all the nonsense, like saving trees and whatnot? Uh, well, <laughs> they probably got it from their good old friendly governments whom they elected in the first place. Indeed, it's amazing how much government employees <laughs> know about how much we need government. The people who really think we need government are the governors, and they're telling us this all the time. There's no end of the propaganda and the self-congratulation you get from governments. In fact, we have several departments in the city of Waterloo that are devoted, as far as I can see, about 100% to self-congratulatory activity. Next slide. <laughs> Transportation. One of my favorite examples of government at work uh, is going on in my community right now. The town already has uh, a big system of buses, most of which run empty most of the time, or close to empty. Uh, and now uh, they are proposing a scheme of light rail for the city, a growing city. It wants to become a, the, meg <laughs> the megalopolis uh, of, uh, of Ontario they want it to be, and they're going to put a light rail system in there, which will make the streets practically unusable that it runs along and which will cost an incredible amount of money. Uh, and nevertheless, we need it, you see, and so they're already going to make us pay for it. That happens, you know, regularly. In fact, it has happened. I mean, the, the parade. I, I once suggested that the city of Waterloo should have a, a marching song for the city called the Parade of the White Elephants. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> now, of course, uh, about local transportation, they could leave it to private companies who would have to run at a profit or get out of business. Has anybody thought of that? Yes. No. And why not? No politician could make a living by proposing something like that. They would put themselves out of business. They would have nothing to do. Some of us think that would be a very good thing. And we can ask the same questions about education, health, welfare, etc. So, Paul, next slide. So, what can we do about this practically, realistically speaking? And at least, I mean, I have a suggestion about this, a suggestion that I think might get us somewhere, um, and that's this. So let's take the people who are paying, which is essentially all of us, and ask whether you would be willing to pay as much as you are in fact paying for the service you're getting, if you even think it is one, if you had your choice. Right? So we take something that the government forces down our throats and say, well, suppose it wasn't forced down our throats. Would we buy it at the price in question? 
how much would be willing to pay in order that, for example, the city get cluttered with unnecessary railroad tracks? Not, I think, very much, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let's go down the list and just ask, okay. And my suggestion is um, a governmental measure is justified if and only if everybody would be willing to pay that much if they had their choice. Then, sure, governments can go right ahead. Whether anything would pass the test is the question. Paul, next slide. <clears throat> now, if they had their choice means, if alternative means of supply were allowed by the government, which of course they often are not, and if you could then compare. So, for example, suppose you had put as much money into a savings account for medical purposes as the government actually takes in taxes for paying for the Canadian medical system. Uh, <clears throat> now, most of us by this time would have a whopping amount of money in the bank to pay for health costs when they arose, um, and in all likelihood uh, we would be way ahead of where we are now. <clears throat> that money, of course, would have earned interest in all those years, um, and uh, <clears throat> so the medical services would be purchased with competitive offerings by doctors, and nothing that isn't allowed now, and so on. Now, if we ask, <clears throat> Do we prefer the system we've got, in which we don't have any choice whether to pay for it, and in which we don't have a whole lot of other choices either, and in which um, one of which is to get great service, except by going to the United States? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> most of us would say on reflection, I don't think so. Now, my test is meant as follows. Since I think we have real property rights, then Everybody would have to say yes, not just a few people. Of course, the beneficiaries, the people who are getting free, whatever, free lunches from this, would all vote in favor of it. Uh, and in some cases, that might even be a, a majority. But if everybody has to say yes, then I think there are very few actual pieces of democratic legislation that would pass. Paul, next. 